sorry for the confusion there. Charlie was ready to sing a special. Uh, but, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10. In case you're wondering, Charlie and Taj are roommates. And whenever Taj dismisses the kids before Charlie sings, you know they're not getting along well. So just try not to meddle. <laughs> I don't know what it's about, Charlie, but in our Sunday school class, we talked about friendship this morning. So one of the things we emphasize is know what your friends are. Matthew chapter 10. Are you there? Okay, let's look at verse uh, 16. This is Jesus speaking to his 12 disciples, and we'll kind of come up to speed after we read our text and after we pray. So let's just read beginning here. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and, and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee you into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops, and fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very heads of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. We're going to end there because it's just impossible to cover everything in our text this morning. And there's a lot more there than what we read as well. Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord's help this morning for our understanding. God, I just pray that you would give us a very, very clear understanding of what it is that you are teaching your disciples, as well as the context within, within which it was taught. God, in the areas in our lives where we do not go through what your disciples did, or God, in the areas of our lives where we see that there is worse coming, I pray that you would just give us perspective. God, the areas where we can practically apply the commands that you gave to your disciples today help us to do the same lord help us to realize that truth that the disciple is not greater than his lord and the servant greater than his master and god it's enough that we be as you are what an amazing truth that is and i pray that you would help us to be able to learn truth apply it and live it this week we ask for jesus sake amen well I want to begin with our context because there are a lot of individuals that take Matthew and develop doctrines within the con within different contexts and actually what they're taught within. So let's let's just talk about very very briefly what it is that Jesus is talking about and who it is that he's talking to within its context. And if you were to read verse one of chapter ten, you would see that when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, this is speaking of Jesus. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease. And then he goes through the list of the 12 disciples. 
And so, what is the context that we are looking at the things that Jesus is teaching? All right, where it's in the context of Jesus sending his disciples to make sure that all of Israel hears that the Messiah, that the Savior, is there and he's alive and that he is demonstrating that he is God and that he is fulfilled and fulfilling all the prophecies of the Scripture. The message is the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This economy of heaven, and speaking of God's way, God's kingdom, it's not something that is in the future, it's not something that's in the past, but it is for the disciples for the present. Specifically in context, they are told to preach only uh, in the coast of Jerusalem and in Israel. They're not supposed to preach uh, the gospel to the Gentiles, they're supposed to preach the gospel to the Jews. Now, is it because Jesus is against the Gentiles? Has God ever wanted the Gentiles to go to hell because they're not Jews? No. You know, a person that believes or teaches something like that has a real, uh, really major misunderstanding of God and God's heart. During the time period in which God was using the nation of Israel or working through Israel, uh, God was not excluding the nations. He was providing a channel for the nations to come to Jesus Christ. And even as we began our study in, in the Gospel of Matthew, the genealogies of Matthew emphasize that God is not an exclusive God that is looking for people who measure up to His standard because no person does. But God is a perfect God who uses imperfect men. And even the genealogy of Matthew emphasizes that, doesn't it? When we see individuals like Tamar, individuals like Ruth, individuals like Rahab, individuals like Joseph himself, who is mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ, though he would have been from a disqualified line of the kings of Judah. So God is not excluding, God is including. And a person who would take the gospel and misconstrue it would also have to ignore a passage we saw a couple of weeks ago. Remember when the centurion came to Jesus and he said, my servant is sick? And he asked Jesus, and Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And he said, no, you don't need to come to my house because... If you just say the word, I understand authority. If you just say the word, he'll be healed. And Jesus turned to uh, all of the Israelites around him and his disciples, and he, he said, I haven't seen so great faith not in Israel. And I'm telling you, I'm summarizing, of course. This is not accurate. Uh, it's not inaccurate, but, uh, but what I'm saying is I'm not quoting. He said, and he said, there are going to be individuals who sit down at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but the children of the kingdom are going to be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so as Jesus is prophesying or preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he is preaching to those individuals who are included to let them know that if they do not believe by faith, they will be excluded. He's not preaching a gospel of exclusion. He's preaching a gospel to those that are included and think that because they have Abraham to their father that they do not need to have faith in the God of Abraham. And so uh, Jesus is now sending out his disciples by twos. And I want to mention something else in our context that fits along with the theme that we've seen as we've been studying through Matthew. I want you to remember that Jesus gave the disciples power to do what? Well, to heal, to cast out devils, and to heal all manners of sicknesses and diseases, and, and when they're doing so, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Did you notice the inclusion in the 12 of those disciples? Who was included that, you know, if you and I were to look at it, we'd say, uh-uh, you're -uh, not giving this guy. Yeah, Judas. Judas. Now, this is not the message for today, but it's important to realize, to recognize. Jesus knew who Judas was. Jesus was never unaware that Judas would betray him. Oftentimes, we look at what a person does and we look at the good works that they do for evidence that they're genuine. And I just want to remind you once again that if you were to look at Judas, as he's been given the power to heal diseases and sicknesses and to cast out devils, there wouldn't be a single one of us that would suspect Judas of being the same one who later on Satan would enter him when he was at the Lord's table. But that's the same Judas. My friend, your works, the things that you have done, the things that I have done, have never been what are evidences that I have eternal life. Judas, if you were to evaluate him on the basis of whether or not God ever worked through him or used him, you'd say he's a child of God. My friend, the fact is, is that he was an unbeliever. 
If you were to make, according to Matthew and the things that Jesus gave us commands for the disciples, if you were to make discipleship a requirement for salvation, Judas would be the most saved of the disciples. And yet he was lost. Don't confuse context. Be very, very careful with context. A lot of strange prophecy that comes uh, from abusing the context that's being taught within. And Matthew chapter 10 is no exception to it. How many of you have heard people say, you know, when Jesus is talking about the gospel, uh, that, or that Jesus is talking about the gospel or salvation, that any person that doesn't confess me, I won't confess him. And any person who denies me, I'll deny him before my Father. And they've actually made that a litmus test for whether a person has actually been born again. There is no end, hear me now, there is no end to the things you can establish or add as requirements for salvation if you don't keep the Scripture within its context. Do you hear me now? There's just no end. It's amazing to me how many times people say it also, and, or but you have to realize when you talk about salvation being simply by faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're going to add requirements to the Gospel, everyone else gets to as well. And if you're, going to, if you're going to create a list for it, I don't think there's an intelligent enough person to check everything out on their list or pray everything in their prayer when they ask to be born again. So it's either what Jesus said it is. When he told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's either as simple as Jesus said in John 3.18 when he said, He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. So the gospel is either what Jesus says the gospel is when he talks about being born again, or it's everything Jesus said when he talks about being born again, plus everything he said is a requirement for discipleship. Keep those matters separate. Listen, every person who's saved ought to be a disciple, isn't it so? Is there a person who's born again who oughtn't to be a disciple? But the question is, is everyone who's a disciple saved? No. It's, it's very similar, if you'll understand it this way, and I, I hope this fits with the series that Charlie's doing in Sunday School right now on faithfulness. There are behaviors that are pretty much universal for a person who's faithful. Isn't it true? You, you convince me that you are faithful in your relationship with God, but don't read your Bible every day. In other words, does reading your Bible every day make you faithful? Does it? No. Unfaithful people can read their Bible every day. Does praying every day make you faithful? No. Unfaithful people can pray every day. Lost people can pray every day. Lost people can read their Bible every day. Being faithful doesn't mean you'll pray and read your Bible. Or I'm sorry, being uh, reading your Bible and praying every day doesn't make you faithful. But how could you be faithful and not do those things? Do you see the difference? Have you ever heard someone say something like this? You know, you can go to church every single time the doors are open, and yet you cannot love God in your heart. Is that true? Yeah. Is that true? You ever met somebody who says, I grew up, my parents made me go to church, and I hated it. I didn't want to go. I hated God. I hated Christianity. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Is it true that you could be in the right place and be wrong inside? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you a question. Could you be wrong inside and not go to the right place? Or could you be right inside and not be in the right place? Not really. You see the difference, though? In other words, I, I, I said it backwards. Do you want me to say it again to clarify it? Could you be right inside and not be in the right place? Not really. Not really. If you're right inside, you're going to be in the right place. Your, what you are inside is going to affect your location. That's a fact, isn't it? Anthony says, no. I think I'm confusing everybody by what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. No, he says... He's, he's nodding yes in, dis, in agreement, I think. Like something like that. Okay, sorry, Anthony. Didn't mean to call you out. I kind of meant to, but I didn't mean, mean to embarrass you. All right, anyway. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Okay, I'm forgiven, so there we go. Thank you. What you are affects what you do, but you can pretend to be what you're supposed to be and not be what you pretend to be. You get it? Yes. Okay. So... One of the things we want to emphasize when we teach faithfulness is we're not trying to teach behavior modification. We're trying to teach heart modification. What's in your heart is what you'll do. You can pretend that the right thing is in your heart when it's not. You can have an ulterior motive. But friend, 
the behavior is going to be right. And the same would true, be true of the disciples. You'd never be able to tell that Judas was an unbeliever because he was an excellent disciple. And even when Jesus sent his disciples out by twos and he gave power to cast out devils, he gave Judas the same power. And even when, when Jesus sent out his disciples and told them to preach the gospel of the kingdom and he said, don't prepare ahead of time what you're going to say. The Spirit of God's going to tell you what to say. The same Spirit of God told Judas what to say. I'll be honest with you. It doesn't help me to see anybody's heart, but it helps me to understand things I don't understand. For instance, have you ever wondered this? Don't, be, don't get angry with me. Don't be mean. Uh, don't think badly of me. But I wonder about guys like Billy Graham sometimes. How could Billy Graham say that Jesus is the only means for eternal life and then say that, you know what, the Catholics, you know, the church is the way for them. Or for the Muslims, Allah is the way for them. You say, Billy Graham says that? Yes, he does. And I'll tell you, I've, I've listened to him preach the gospel many times where he presented it just as the Bible teaches it. Just like Jesus says it. And then he says something else as well. And I wonder, how could the man say that? I'm not commenting on what's in Billy Graham's heart. God knows. I don't. But I understand things this way. You know, Judas looked like a good disciple and he wasn't. Actually. And what I see isn't always what God sees. And that's enough. By the way, don't say, Pastor, do you think Billy Graham is lost? I don't have an opinion about Billy Graham. I'm using it for an illustration. You see where I'm coming from here today? But you better know what you are. What you do doesn't make you what you are when it comes to believing in Jesus. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, being faithful or giving or even being used by God doesn't make you a believer. Judas was actually used by God in a positive way. And yet there came a point in time when Satan entered him. And my friend, I promise you, Judas is burning in hell today in spite of the fact that he looked like a good disciple. So don't develop doctrine for salvation from John chapter 10. Yeah, Matthew chapter 10, I'm sorry. Don't develop doctrine that you add to the gospel from Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 is talking about Jesus sending his disciples and letting him know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 10 is not Jesus saying this is the way to have eternal life. Is that established? See, there are books full of false doctrine written that began with the wrong premise about what the disciples were preaching. What was the disciples' message? You must be born again or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a difference in the message. They were preaching a gospel not to the world, but to Israel. Letting him know, your Messiah, your Savior, he's here. There's a difference. You see that? Okay, I, I got very, very few knots. So either everyone just completely disagrees with me, or you have no idea what I'm saying, and I don't know what to do about it because I've spent too much time on it, and I've got to move on. So my apologies if I've been unclear, and I meant my unclarity and kindness. Verse 16. Jesus is telling his disciples their perspective, and, and the passage that we read today is all about perspective, about how to think about things. You know, perspective really has everything to do with how you'll respond, doesn't it? Your perspective on why something is going a certain way or how something is happening really has a lot to do with how you're going to respond. For instance, has anyone here ever worked out in a way, I mean, worked out hard uh, for either your health or to see particular gains or trying to accomplish things. I talk a lot of times about how much I hate running, and I, I do hate running. Uh, not because there's no value in it, but just because for me it's like torture. Running is like torture. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if your body, if your flesh talks to you the way my body talks to me, but my body starts talking the moment I make it do something. If I make my body get out of bed in the morning, it starts telling me stuff. You didn't sleep enough. You're making me get up. I don't feel like getting up. If I'm getting up, I'm just getting up to eat. That's the only reason I'm getting up and then I'm going back to sleep. Whatever. My body, does your body talk to you like that? So when I'm running, I'm having a discourse with my body. I'm telling my body, you're going to run however many miles. Sometimes I lie to my body about it. I like have this plan. This is what I'm going to tell myself, and this is what I'm actually doing. Okay. So I'm going to tell myself you only have to run a mile, but I'm actually going to try to run five. You know? And the whole time we're having this discussion, so I take off running. You know, I always feel good like the first couple strides, you know. 
and then all of a sudden your body goes, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and you're like, we're running. And I'm probably like crazy person in the world, but I think other people have this happen too. And my body says, how long? And I say, just a mile. My body says, you're lying. You're going to try to make me run. Let's, and then my body says, let's run a little slower. And I say, no, no, we need to run at this pace. And my body says, that'll kill me. You can't do it. You know, I'll have a heart attack. And I tell him, no, you won't have a heart attack. You've done this before. If you do have a heart attack, you deserve it because you're in such bad shape. You know, we just have this discussion, you know. And then he gets down to the point of, like, where your body says, I can't do this anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Your body says, one more, I can't do one more step. It'll kill me. And you say, well, I'll tell you what. Just go to the stop sign. You know, just go to the stop sign. It's a lie because when I get to the stop sign, I'm going to turn the corner. You know, but just go to, just make it to the stop sign. Just run it out to the stop sign. I get to the stop sign. I tell my body, okay, we're just going to go. And then we get to going, you know, just, you know, one, one crack in the sidewalk. Just pass that crack. Just the next one, you know, just one more step. One more step. One more step. And my body talks to me the whole time. And it's constantly telling me, you're going to kill me. You're going to die. What a stupid way to die. There's no point in this. There's no use in this. You're going to get injured. And I'm just having this argument the entire time. That's the way running is for me. Now, it does get better. Uh, if you start exercising continuously, after a while, you do improve. You do see some improvements where, you know, your body starts talking later or your body just realizes it's futile, you don't listen, and you're just going to make it do whatever. And then you can actually get to the point where it's actually enjoyable to exercise. But you go through the pain for the purpose of gain, right? You know the old phrase, no pain, no gain? And the gain is actually worthwhile. So perspective is what makes it worthwhile, actually doesn't it? You have to tell yourself, you know, maybe you'll get to live an extra week if you're in good shape or something because body exercise, bodily exercise does profit a little. And so maybe there'll be some gain in it. Or if you run this fast, then you can go and eat a big dinner and it won't be as bad as if you <laughs> had. So whatever the thing is. But perspective does make the difference in life, doesn't it? When you're going through something and you have a perspective of this is what the goal is. Well, oh, I caught that mosquito. This is what the goal is. This is what the end is. This is what the gain is, and that's a purpose. And Jesus is about to send his disciples out. He describes it as being sheep among wolves. Now, if you've ever been on the two sides, I'll just be quite blunt with you. I'd rather be a wolf than a sheep if I have to choose between the two. Not realistically. Don't take that out of context. Like, well, you know, Pastor Price is a wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather be a wolf than a sheep simply because I'd rather be the predator than the prey, wouldn't you? And Jesus is simply saying, I'm sending you out as prey among the predators. So know what it is. Know what it is. So he said, first of all, beware of men. Beware of men. <laughs> he said, for they, in verse 17, will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. Let me stop there just for a second because it's a help to us to know that he's not talking about preaching the Word of God. He's talking about when you're tried before the councils or before kings. Don't figure out a clever defense on how you're going to get out of things. I'll take care of you. Learn dependency on me. And so... In verse 20, he said, It's not you, it's not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So I'm going to take care of what to say. Now the perspective then is when, for the sake of Jesus Christ, obviously we know the Scripture says that when we're buffeted, uh, there's a difference between being buffeted for our fault. Buffet means to be struck or punched or hit with a blow. When you're struck, remember that you're not just struck uh, remember, there's a difference between being struck because of something you've done or being buffeted because of my sake, for my sake. And my friend, if you're persecuted, the first perspective we see here is that if you undergo persecution for the sake of the Master, then God's going to be the one who takes care of you. So many times we wonder if we're faithful to God, what would happen to us when we forget that God will take care of us. And so that's the first perspective. God's going to tell you what. You don't have to worry about having wisdom. You don't have to worry about knowing what to say. God will take care of that. Now again, the context is when Jesus was sending out his disciples uh, one by one. But the principles apply universally. 
In words, the same would be true today, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be true today that if for the sake of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way that we're told to, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. If you're to do that, you'll probably have persecution. You'll probably undergo what the Bible calls tribulation. And if you do so, remember the perspective that if God wants you to do it and you undergo it, then God will take care of you. And that's a universal principle. Universal truth, not just a principle. Okay, and then we see betrayal. Verse 21, betrayal. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. You know, almost any time I share the gospel with somebody, and they're really seriously evaluating and considering being born again, almost any time that happens, the relationship matter comes up. I don't know how many times, I don't, I don't keep track, and it's probably too many times to count anyway, but I don't know how many times people have told me, I trust Jesus, but you know what? It really bothers me that my father didn't believe in Jesus. Or my mother. And if dad or mom aren't in heaven, I'm not sure I want to go to heaven. Now, you say, Pastor, they obviously don't understand eternal judgment. You know, the fact of the matter is that it's an important consideration. How many times people have said to me, you know something, I trust Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not sure how that would affect my family. Listen, if you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if your family are devout Catholic, and you get born again, it's going to mess up your relationship with your family, and that's a fact. It will happen. In other words, when your family finds out you're a follower of Jesus... It's going to affect their family. Last week, a Shamir and I uh, had the opportunity to witness to a Muslim man. He was very open, actually. We just witnessed a little bit. He said he's going to come to church sometime. But um, he talked about how that the Muslims, you know, they believe the Bible is the Word of God and that the Quran just basically adds to it, which we know the last couple of verses in the Bible say can't be so. But the fact of the matter is if that man were to believe in Jesus... The very book that he claims Muslims believe is the Word of God, he'd be ostracized from every one of his family members. That's the reality of it. So what they say isn't true. The Bible says that for the cause or the sake of Jesus Christ, for the disciples themselves, that brother is going to turn against brother and children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. In verse 22 he said, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Again, let me just tell you something. This is not the gospel. The gospel is not the perseverance of the saints or the ability of a person to last and not cave to hardship. Let me ask you a question. Did Peter endure to the end? Now and again. Right? He finished well. But, you know, at the time of the cross, if you were to make this the standard for salvation, Peter would be as lost as anybody in the world. He denied Jesus. He said vehemently with cursing, I know not the man. Friend, this is not the gospel. But this is the reality of following Jesus. I've preached the gospel before and had people accompanying me when someone's about to trust Jesus as their Savior that have said, now hold on a second. Do you know that you're going to have to turn against your mom and dad and against your brothers and sisters? And you're going to have to leave your friends and, and uh, you, know, you realize what you're doing when you receive Jesus as your Savior? The fact of the matter is no lost person really understands that. A lost person understands their allegiance to Jesus when they turn to Jesus as their Savior. But the consequences of being born again, my friend, aren't part of the Gospel. It's just happened. This is discipleship Jesus is talking about here. It's a consequence of being a disciple of Jesus. And can I say to you that it's more than just what Jesus even mentioned here. It's more specific. You make the determination that you're going to follow Jesus in a different way and Christians will turn against you. I remember back when I was a teenager. No, not even a teenager. Probably 11 or 12 years old. And I remember being in my dad's radiator shop and having another Christian man excoriate my dad. I mean, just let my dad have it. And he, the other man was a Christian, no question about that. But uh, he's, he was talking about decisions my dad had made, which had to do with separation, biblical separation. Um, my dad had decided that because going to a public school was terrible for him, that he wasn't going to send his kids to a public school. 
my dad made that decision. By the way, uh, you teenagers, you young people that go to public school, God help you. You know, and we want to help you. And uh, the truth can, can help you. But I want to tell you something. You are being attacked. Your faith is going to be constantly attacked on a continual basis. And you'll be taught things that undermine you as a person and especially as a Christian. And so this is not talking about, oh, you shouldn't go to a public school. If, you, if you're a child, you don't have a choice about that. We understand God can help you. And you can have victory and God can do great things. But my dad made the decision because his life was really messed up before he was saved. My kids are never going to public school. I remember that man telling my dad, you're making your kids weird. You're making your kids, of course, I mean, that's genetic anyway, first of all. But you're making your kids weird. You know, you think, and then he said, you think you're better than every other Christian because you're sending your kids to a Christian school. My dad didn't think that. He just didn't want what happened to him to happen to his kids. That was all. And I remember him saying, you know, when you go to that little church, and you think that because, you know, you just think that everything in the Bible you have to obey, and you just think, and just told him all these things. And I remember, I remember even as a kid just thinking, wow, what a terrible thing to say. You know, that was a brother in Christ. That was a brother in Christ who should have said, you know, thank God that God changed your heart and that you're concerned about the very things <laughs> that, were, that wrecked your life. You know, sometimes it's a Christian that will attack a Christian. Sometimes, if you're living for Jesus, your life or your testimony may cause conviction in the life of someone else, and you're not saying anyone else has to do it. I don't remember my dad ever telling anyone else, you shouldn't do that with your kids. I just remember people telling my dad how to raise his kids. What he was wrong about. You know, that'll happen if you follow Jesus. You make some decisions, some determinations in your life to follow Jesus, and my friend, even saved people will be bothered by it. Lost people sometimes are convicted by what you do, but oftentimes it's people that are born again that are more bothered by your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus said that brother will turn against brother and father against uh, uh, child and child against his parents and so forth, my friend, that's certainly true, and it's true to the extreme. Jesus said, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Can I deal with this, he that endureth to the end shall be saved statement very briefly? Is it in the context of the gospel? Let me ask that question. Is John, I keep saying John, is Matthew chapter 10 explaining how to be born again? Is that what Matthew 10 is teaching? Or is it Jesus sending his disciples out to teach of the gospel of the kingdom? Is there a difference? There is, isn't there? Okay, endure to the end shall be saved. What does that mean? <coughs> it means if you survive, you'll be, you won't be killed. I'm not trying to be overly simplistic, but it means exactly what it says. If you make it, you'll be alive. <laughs> At the, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. What he's saying is don't quit. Matter of fact, he goes on uh, to, to talk about how that when he returns or when he comes again, and he's not talking about a future event, actually. He's actually talking about when he meets up with his disciples again. Of course, he's sending them out because why? Well, because uh, six teams plus Jesus can cover a lot more ground than Jesus with 12 people following him. So he's sending them out to preach the things that he said. Okay, let's look at some more perspective, shall we? Verse 23, the Bible says, When they persecute you in this city, flay you into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Let me ask you, past, present, future event from our perspective today. Future? Past. It's a past perspective. When Jesus said, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come, become, who is he talking to? Disciples. The disciples, the twelve, right? Yeah. In this context, he's talking to the twelve. You know, there are some crazy doctrines that have been developed from a misapplication of this verse. Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples who he's sending out, and he's sending out during his ministry. <clears throat> this is not a salvific doctrine, and this is not a prophetic doctrine, my friend. This is simply Jesus explaining to his disciples. You're going to go into cities. You're going to be persecuted in the cities. When you're persecuted, then go ahead and uh, go ahead and go to the next one, and you won't be through all of them before I come and meet you. And that's exactly what it means. And there's a lot of crazy doctrine. There are books of false doctrine that have been written about these verses. Matter of fact, I've said this before, and I hope that you'll consider it. 
and uh, just just ponder it just a little bit. The the more unscriptural and biblical a doctrine is, the thicker the book. <laughs> That'll be written to prove it. The less biblical it is, the, the more writing it takes to prove it. The more sources will have to be cited that aren't the Bible. And the more writing it'll take, the more words it'll take to prove something that isn't true. Moving forward. Next perspective, humility. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. What does he mean? Well, he proves it in verse 25. It's enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. Here's a perspective in hardship, my friend. Is it an honor to be like Jesus? Can you imagine? I don't know about you, but I hope we have some individuals that have courage here, whether men or ladies in this room. Can you imagine having the opportunity to be given the power to represent Jesus? And when you go into a city to be able to heal sickness, to be able to cast out devils, can you imagine being given that opportunity? Knowing that it would also come with the consequences of persecution. Sign me up. I'm, I'm not saying I'm a great, brave person, but if I'm given the opportunity to have God work through me like that, if I'm going to go and be brought before a council or before a court or before governors or authorities, and God is going to give me the words to speak and deliver me, sign me up. Sign me up. Now, if I'm going to do it for my, on my own and I wouldn't know what to do, forget about it. But listen, if I can have God's power in my life, and if I can have God take care of my needs, sign me up. Wouldn't that be true for you? My friend, the perspective that we need to have as a believer is this. We don't need to have health, wealth, and prosperity. We need to have God take care of us. We need to rest in who, is, who we're serving. Listen, if I'm going to go through persecution, that's all right so long as God's going to take care of me. And there's some more perspective about that as well. Uh, the first perspective is, you're, or one of the perspectives is that the disciple's not above his master. It's enough to be like Jesus. Somebody says, that's, that's, that's like Jesus. Well, that's an honor. It's a privilege, isn't it? Who's Jesus? I'm glad you guys know that. He's God, okay? He's the master. Jesus is God. If somebody calls you, man, that's, that's Jesus working right there. If they say that you're a representative of Jesus Christ, is that an honor? Yes, it is. If they're persecuting you when they say that, is it an honor? Yes, it is. Jesus said, if they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him of his household? If you were uh, to just go back to verse 34 of the previous chapter, the Pharisees said he casted out devils through the prince of the devils. If they, told, if they said about Jesus when He cast out devils that He did so by the power of the devil, my friend, if they say that you're doing things in the power of the devil, are you going to be okay? If Jesus is okay with it, I am too. In verse 36, we see the command to be fearless. Fear not them, therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak in light, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be able to just Declare truth. Not have it just be a fire in your bones, but words that come out, your, out of your mouth, out of your lips. What a wonderful thing. Jesus said, the things that I've told you quietly, yell them out. Preach the truth. Speak the truth. The things that you've heard in secret, the things that you've heard in the darkness, speak them in the light. And the things that have been spoken only in your ear, yell them from the housetops. It's a tough thing to keep quiet about good news, isn't it? God doesn't want us to. And then he goes on to say another perspective. First of all, we're, to be, uh, we're supposed to have humility. We're supposed to be fearless. We're supposed to be unashamed. We just The things that are told in darkness, we speak them in light. We don't hide anything. And then the other perspective is to not fear them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Lost people and saved alike tend... To, re to respect persons more than God, and that's a fact. Think of it from this perspective. There are things, and I'm not saying, I, I don't know what the things are, but there are things that you wouldn't mind doing so long as pastor weren't there. There are things you'd do 
but not if I were with you. I know it because I got spies following you around, watching you, <laughs> and uh, they tell me what you do. <laughs> I know it because you're human. But there are things that it, you'd be embarrassed if I knew. There are things you think or think, places you go, things you do, you'd be bothered about it. But the fact of the matter is that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and doesn't bother you at all. Because we tend to respect men's persons more than God. And Jesus told His disciples, you need to care what I think more than what people think. If you're going to be persecuted because you're a follower of Me, are you going to stop following Me because of a person who persecutes you? Listen, if they're going to harm you, someone's going to do physical harm to you, the perspective is don't be afraid of a person who can kill your body. Be afraid of the person who can destroy your soul in hell. And who's that God? Friend, for believers and unsaved alike, we are afraid too much of what people think. There are people who will go to hell because they're afraid of what their friends would think if they receive Jesus and follow Him. There are people who will uh, live in sin and do things and not be concerned about what God thinks, but they're concerned about what other believers think. And Jesus said, fear the right person. Make sure that your fear is in the right perspective. God is an eternal judge, and what God thinks uh, matters forever. And what God says or what God judges will matter forever. And then we see the perspective of God's provision. Verse 29 are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Understand your worth from God's perspective. Understand what you're worth from God's perspective. You have so much value to God, and God cares so much about you, that He knows the difference in the number of hairs on your head from yesterday and today. Oh, God knows how many hairs are in your head, knows which one's about to fall off, and He cares about you. God knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, and He cares. <coughs> you're worth more to God than a sparrow is. You have high value to God. And if you're going to undergo persecution, my friend, one of the things that you and I need to know is that God cares. God's concerned with it. If you were to read the revelation of Jesus Christ, you would see that underneath the throne are the souls of the saints crying, Oh Lord, how long? And God literally has a judgment for the martyrs. For those individuals that have been killed for their faith, God has reserved for them a special vengeance that only He will take on the wicked. God cares about those who follow Him who are persecuted. From an American perspective today, it's very difficult to relate sometimes to persecution, to tribulation. It's amazing. I uh, just had somebody tell me about oh, one of the ladies in our church in Miami Beach. She said, you know, when we were in, uh, I, I want to say it was Pakistan, but I may be wrong. Just recently, she was in Pakistan. There was a man who was a doctor who wanted her to come and do a clinic. And then something happened in his town where they killed a bunch of Christians and they can't find him anymore. He's gone. What happened to him? Well, either he's hiding or he's probably he was probably killed for his faith. And that's reality for a lot of people in the world today. So people are going through. The notion uh, that tribulation doesn't happen for people that love Jesus or follow Jesus, my friend, is just untrue. But the notion that God is not on the throne and that God cannot take care of those who undergo tribulation, my friend, is also false. I don't have time to develop this today, but there's a difference between judgment that happens as a result, or persecution that happens as a result of wicked men, and persecution that, or a judgment that happens as a result of God. The events in Revelation the events that we call the tribulation, are tribulation. There's other tribulation besides that. But the difference between the events we find in Revelation and the events that you read about like in this text and what happens today, the difference in those events is that God is responsible for the one and man's responsible for the other. And when man's responsible for persecution and for tribulation, my friend, God is able to take care of His children. 
And God is able to take care of their souls. And God will exact vengeance on the wicked. In the case, though, where God is the one who is destroying the wicked or judging the wicked, my friend, there's no recourse. See, in tribulation, you have a recourse. God will take care of you. God will handle it. You say, Pastor, I don't want to go through this. My friend, God will take care of you. God will give you grace. I'm always amazed when I read in, in the Acts, and I'm going to finish with this illustration. I'm always amazed when I read in the Acts of the Apostles in the early church when I see uh, Stephen being stoned to death. And there are two vivid pictures that are painted in, the, in, in Acts about that scene that unfolds. The first picture is that the Bible says they beheld his face as though it was the face of an angel. While the man was being put to death, he literally had so much of God's grace in his life that he looked out of this world. He looked almost like a heavenly being. That's grace, isn't it? And God can give that grace. The second perspective that I have on it is that the Bible says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. There's a man named Saul there who deserved God's eternal judgment and God saved his soul. And that same man was able to undergo the same grace that Stephen underwent when he was persecuted for the faith. So, how do we tie all these events in? Well, this is an important passage of, of Matthew. Today our application, if we were to apply it, would not be that we're being sent out through the cities of Israel with the power to heal diseases, to cast out devils, and to heal sicknesses, right? That's not the application today. The application that we see today is that the same God who sent out His disciples is the same God that we serve. And while some of the things that are said in the passage are not for us specifically, they're included so that we can see the nature of our Savior. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Well, my friend, Jesus clearly is God. And as the result of all of these things that are done, when John the Baptist from prison sends and says, Art thou he who is to come, or should we look for another? And I'm not going to preach a message about John the Baptist's lack of faith. These things are used as an example of who Jesus was, that he is God. I want us to leave here this morning having a very, very clear picture of who Jesus is. My friend, Jesus is God. And the things that Jesus did are pointed to as evidence that Jesus is God. Secondly, being a disciple is not the means for eternal life. Faithfulness to God, my friend, isn't the means for salvation. Faithfulness to God is the means to survive persecution and tribulation in our lives. If you go through tribulation and you're not faithful to God, my friend, you just can't make it, can you? Because you have to have God's grace. And then the perspective. The perspective. Don't forget who you serve. I'm not here today preaching a message that if you follow Jesus, life is just going to be terrible because that actually hasn't been my experience. The fact of the matter is, is that following Jesus is 100% worthwhile. But you need to understand some things that are going to happen if you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to have God's power in your life, you're going to be treated like God. It's simply what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you're God. He's saying... It's an honor to be as the Master. And really, when it comes down to that, that's actually a privilege, isn't it? Remember when the disciples were beaten, Peter and John, and they departed from the presence of the council, this is in Acts, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name? You know, persecution can be an opportunity for rejoicing. I feel like it would be a disservice to finish without also saying this. Life's going to be tough whether you know Jesus or whether you don't. You know, sometimes we're very unsympathetic to what people go through. We look at people's lives and we think, you know what, everybody's going through that. Yeah, but it doesn't make it any easier, does it? People are going through hardship. But there's a major difference between going through hardship as a child of the King. From the perspective of being treated like the master and going through hardship without the king, without the master, without Jesus. It would be rather futile to go from city to city and preach a cause or fight for a cause that God wasn't for or that God wouldn't honor or reward. And that wasn't the case at all for the disciples. Was it worth it in the end? 
Did they come back to be with the Lord Jesus again? Yeah, they made it. And what an account Matthew gave of those things that God did and used him to do. Will it be worth it for you to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords? 100%. Absolutely. It will give you a perspective. What's your perspective on the hardships of life? Father, I thank you so much for what you've taught us here this morning. And God, I ask that you would allow these truths to sink in and to apply. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a minute, I'd like to sing just a hymn of invitation. And it would just be for the, for the purpose of making sure that everyone here today has the opportunity just to respond about a couple of things if God's speaking to your heart. The invitation is a time we and just invite you to say yes if God has said, I want this in your life. Or for you to seek help or counsel if God has shown you something that's a need in your life. The first area of the invitation would be if you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You may say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I know Jesus or not. If you don't know if you know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you can. And that would be what the invitation would be about here this morning. We're going to turn to page 351. While we do that, let me say the second part of the invitation would be this. There are aspects of our life where we're going to go through things. And the perspective that we have is going to have everything to do with how we respond and with whether or not God is able to use it. And God can use persecution in your life just as He used it in the life of the disciples. But it might be that you've had the wrong perspective about it. You've had the wrong perspective. Maybe you've even made the decision not to follow Jesus, not to be a disciple of Jesus because of persecution. Could I say to you that from the perspective that Jesus gives, it's worthwhile to be a disciple? Maybe that's the decision you need to make today. You know, there's things I haven't committed to God because I just haven't counted the cost, or I've counted the cost and I didn't have the right perspective. But now that I see the perspective, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. That's the invitation this morning. If you stand to your feet, if God spoke into your heart, I feel like this morning, if you need to be born again, Brother Taj is in the back. Uh, I'm up front. You can just come or just motion to us or beg and let us know, Pastor, I don't know about this matter of eternal life. I don't know that I'm saved. The matter of discipleship, that's auxiliary. That's ancillary. But I don't know if I'm even saved. I don't even know if I know Jesus as my Savior. If God's spoken to you about that, do business with Him this morning. The second area is a matter of discipleship. It might be that God has been tugging on your heart. He's been telling you, you need to make a decision about following me. You need to make a decision with this perspective. God's shown you the perspective. Will you do business with Him? Page 351, near the cross. Mm -hmm.